right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the keynote. Um, I wanted to start out. We have a lot of people to thank. <laughs> Let's start with our sponsors at Indiana University Bloomington, the philosophy department and chair Adam Blake for their immediate and ongoing support. Uh, the Center of Excellence for Women in Technology for contributing to our programming. The College of Arts and Sciences with special thanks to the Arts and Humanities Council for supporting novel projects like this. The Institute for Digital Arts and Humanities for their support and for showing us uh, how an event like this could be pulled off. And the Luddy AI Center for their funding and outreach. Uh, also thanks to our external sponsor, Engage AI, an innovative nonprofit striving to leverage AI and machine learning to enhance lives, safeguard our environment, and further the UN's 2030 agenda. Uh, Engage AI aims to demystify AI, foster diverse dialogues, and shape national and global policies for ethical and equitable AI development. They're proud to support this online conference and engage with this critical dialogue. We are so excited to have CT Nguyen with us today, who has uh, been a big inspiration for both of us in terms of just like trying out stuff with public philosophy to see what sticks, and also having the courage to talk about whatever philosophical topics interest you even if there isn't like a five million papers deep literature that you can stake your career on. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, C. T. Nguyen is a philosophy professor at the University of Utah. T thinks about how technology and social structures influence our values and agency. His book, Games, Agency is Art, explores how games shape our agency by letting us temporarily live out what it would be like to pursue different goals and values. All right. It's me. I'm up. Yeah, go right. for it. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here at like, you know, late Saturday. It's it's a time. Um, thanks for the few of you that have your cameras on. I'm going to need that to be seen. I once gave a talk with all camera and I just like lost, uh, slowly lost all capacity to think. Let me put my PowerPoint up. Um, PowerPoint looking good. Can you see the thing? Awesome. Uh, first, I want to apologize. I have caught a nasty cold from my kids. I'm pretty out of it. This is going to be me functioning at about half mode. I've just taken three ibuprofen and two espressos. So maybe maybe I can pull this together. So the what I've been thinking about actually comes strangely from two sides. I've been working a lot in aesthetics and the philosophy of games. Um, and I got really interested in games in how we have this ability to just jump onto a clear point system. And I started worrying a lot about the way that affected us when we got exposed to things like rankings and metrics, right? I mean, most of us in the room are probably philosophers and you would think that if anyone was immune to like being completely swamped and captured by a simplistic metric, it would be a philosophers. But if as anyone in the profession knows, we are not, right? We are status obsessed, we're list obsessed, we're metric obsessed. And so I've been doing a lot of work trying to understand where metrics come from. And this has led me to read this really rich and fascinating literature that I'm going to spend most of the day talking about, mostly in science and technology studies, mostly driven not by people in philosophy, but by empiricists, sociologists, historians, and anthropologists who worked a lot with philosophers like Ian Hacking and Bruno Latour uh, and a deeply Foucaultian approach. Um, and they have taught me something, and I've tried to draw that something forward about the nature of data at its essence. So that's what I wanna talk about. So my goal today is to talk about a number of themes that I'm, I've basically, this is like two thirds of book report of cool shit I found from STS and this incredibly rich literature on quantification studies. And a lot of the people working in this space have been really interested in, oh my God, algorithms, it's new. And a lot of the problems that they're talking about, they talk about as if they've just appeared where people in STS have been tracking some version of this problem for 30 years. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna give you a kind of a book report. I'm gonna talk about things that it's made me think and give you some of the arguments I've pushed. And I'm gonna talk mostly about constraints on large scale institutional data sets that might be useful for thinking about how we train AI because we train AI using these enormous data sets. I wanna give, um, and the general theme of what I'm gonna say is that institutional data collection involves constraints of scale 
of being able to collect data in a reliable and semi-standardized way across a large scale that produces certain kinds of typical constraints and biases that goes into these data sets. What I'm particularly interested in is constraints and biases that, I mean, we talk a lot about and I'm very concerned about racial bias, gender bias, the kind of familiar forms of bias, but I'm particularly interested in a kind of bias that might be baked into the nature of data itself, right? That we couldn't get rid of even if we fixed most of the other problems. That is comes from the nature of scale. So here's the big caveat. I find it really important to say that I know basically nothing about machine learning. Like I've hung out at a few conferences. I know a little bit. I do not know more than like, a, Pretty much, I'm sure everyone in the room knows about what I know about machine learning. So in particular, there's going to be a question of, uh, I'm going to talk about constraints on the data set. And there's a question about whether machine learning can transcend limitations in the data set. I cannot answer this question. This is a question for people in the audience. This is a question for technologists and people that know way more about CS than I do. But I can tell you about the constraints in the data set, and hopefully that'll help you. Um, and there's one place, one particular example where I think the data set and the constraints on the data set really particularly shape the machine learning algorithms we see right now, and that's in setting the target, right? A lot of the times you train, uh, you train uh, algorithms iteratively, you, you, and you pick the models, the iterated models that best hit the target, and then there's a question of who gets to set that target and how do we collect data about that target? And there are cases where you can clearly see the limitations we're talking about immediately show up. Um, I don't think ChatGPT is trained this way. So unfortunately, I have even less to say about ChatGPT. But a lot of the other models we know, I, I can say something directly about. But this is really kind of background stuff for people that know more about CS than me. So here's a guiding thought from Sina Fazalpour, uh, an excellent paper on algorithmic bias that I find very teachable to especially CS students, by the way. So Sina Fazalpour says that bias enters into algorithmic processes at four points, the data collection point, the target setting point, the model validation point, and the context of deployment point, right? So of course, like, so here's this great example of a student success algorithm that's currently being used to predict what students will be successful. And there are data collection problems. So a lot of the times it's based on survey data that's uh, where the surveys are collected at the student career center. There's a very clear bias about which students show up at the student career center, right? Target setting. This is going to be something we're we'll talk about later. So, in a lot of the training algorithms, the uh, sorry, the algorithms were trained to predict student success. But what counted as student success was set by administrators who ordered the models and not by students. So we're going to talk about this a lot. Student success in the models that we have is defined in terms of graduation rate, graduation speed, and postgraduate employment. Things that don't show up: happiness, humility, reflection, like any of that other stuff that we might care about, doesn't show up in the right. That's target setting. Model validation is all the shit that people actually do when you're building the model. And context of deployment is uh, biases that come from using a model trained in one context and shifting it to another context. For example, in Fazil uh, example, the a lot of the student success algorithms we have were trained on data from the Ivy League and then immediately sold to community colleges with no modification, right? So one of the things that Fazil Poor says is that when you talk to technologists and machine learning people, they hyper-focus on model validation and they ignore the other stuff. I recently got to teach a guest lecture at an algorithmic fairness grad class taught in the CS department. And I went through this and we went through some examples and I asked them what percent of their class had been about model validation. And they said 99.5%. I asked them how much they talked about data collection uh, biases, they'd said two minutes. Uh, this was in week 12, by the way. And I asked them how much they talked about target setting bias, and it had never even occurred to them. And this is the graduate seminar on algorithmic fairness at a major CS department. So what I'm going to talk about a lot involves the uh, like one, two, and four, right? I'm going to leave model validation alone, because that's something that CS people know about. We can, we can talk about the other stuff. So there are three kind of filters or biases I'm really concerned with. Um, under three themes. So loosely, they're about travel and context, expertise and skill, and target setting. And this is, this is the roadmap for the rest of what we're going to be talking about. So we're going to start with travel and context. So there's this crucial idea that comes, I find the clearest version of this idea in Theodore Porter's book, Trust in Numbers. So Theodore Porter is a historian uh, who worked in the history of quantification. Trust in Numbers is a book from about the 90s. And he's a historian, but he's deeply inspired by figures like Ian Hacking. So a lot of you in the room uh, who do Phil Sy stuff might find it familiar. And he has this thought. And 
when he says that, he says there's a difference between what you might call knowledge and information. So knowledge and understanding in this category, this specific category, this new category called information. Uh, where quantitative data is kind of the paradig paradigmatic form of information, but it isn't the only form of information. Information, he says, is knowledge that has been prepared to be understood by distant strangers. So for the first part of this talk, I'm going to focus on this idea and talk about what limitations might be introduced by the constraint that knowledge is something that's under readily understandable by distant strangers. By the way, this seems to have stood the test of time. So Sabina Leonelli is kind of the foremost philosopher of data right now. She has an incredibly new book on big data in biology. And her updated account is basically a kind of refined version of Porter's account. She says what it is to be data is data is knowledge that has been prepared to travel to unexpected contexts and be put to unexpected uses, right? So key is this notion of travel and portability across contexts. So what we're going to talk about is whether there's something left out by the demands of travel. So the worry is that there's going to be a bias baked into the nature of data itself, given the nature of data as something that's been prepared to travel, right? It, it's kind of, if this is right, then this is not contingent, but an ineradicable bias in the nature of data and any process that depends on data, where data, again, is something that's been prepared. I mean, the whole idea of what data is, is that different groups of people in vastly different parts of the world can collect something and put it in a repository, and they'll all collect it in the same way, and they can use data collected from anywhere, right? It's been prepared to travel. So if that's the goal and function, what if that leaves something out? So again, this is not contingent bias. This is sort of gender ethnicity that a lot of us have talked about and that we should be worried about. But I think what we're going to find is bias against intimate, sensitive, and high context ways of understanding things, and against things that depend on a lot of locally variable information. So the key thought in Porter and Trust in Numbers is this. He's interested in the difference in quantified and qualitative, quali quantitative and qualitative knowledge. So qualitative knowledge, he says, is nuanced and sensitive and variable, context sensitive, dynamic, but it travels really badly between contexts. It needs to, a high amount of shared context to understand. Quantitative knowledge, as we find it in institutions, this is going to be the star on everything I say. I'm not talking about some abstraction. I'm talking about how we get the thing that we actually find in our institutions, given the way that they work at scale. Um, gets around the context difficulty problem, creates portability and travel by stripping off nuance and any kind of features that require high context to understand, which renders the information readily transmissible between people with little shared context. So here's the easiest example for all of us in academia. Qualitative assessments of students are what we write in their essays, right? They're rich, they're complicated, they're responsive, they can address any new thing that pops up, they can be multidimensional. We can introduce as many dimensions as we want. We can talk about them in complex ways. We don't have to reduce them to a single scale. My evaluations of my philosophy students are incomprehensible to a business dean, right? Let alone someone out, an employer, right? That it, most of the important information there involves a shared language and a shared understanding that comes from the particular context. Quantitative information is GPA, right? And think about this is the core thought. The what GPA works because everyone can kind of under, shares an understanding of what A through F means. It's a simple scale. We all can collect things into it, and then data can aggregate. But does this make sense? So we can't, there's not really a way to aggregate someone's qualitative evaluations from their English classes, their creative writing classes, and their philosophy classes, and their biology classes. But because GPA is a decontexted scale, right, with the nuances stripped out, then we can all collect into it, and then it aggregates, right? So if this makes sense, what Porter's, this is kind of the core idea, what Porter's showing us is the thing that makes data powerful is exactly functionally irrevocably tied up with this decontexting, denuancing power, right? It can't work, a, you get a lot of data across scale if you can all collect in a similar way, but that means you can't use any collection methodology that has to be highly variable and responsive to particular contexts and settings, right? So, Here's a really interesting example, he says. This is a more complicated example than GPA. Um, so this is my favorite example of anything, actually. So he says that we used to, so this comes from a, Pol a, study, a, a study of medieval Polish land measures. And we used to, in Europe, different parts of Europe, have 
a kind of similar unit of measure, which in England was called the hide. And the hide was the unit of land required to feed the average family. I mean, this is an amazing unit, right? So uh, if you can see a uh, hide isn't a variable, isn't the same volume, right? A hide near a rich river is small, a hide in a forest is medium, a hide in a grassland is large. And it also depends on things like, so for example, if a, if a particular area of land is fertile 70% of the time, but incredibly infertile on drought years, you're going to fit, need a fair amount of that to be a hide, right? So a hide is a very functionally rich amount of information, but it requires a lot of, uh, not, it requires a lot of local knowledge to implement. So what you see, he says, is a shift from hides to acres when you move, for, we move from uh, localized governance to centralized governance. The hide is not really administrable from a distant bureaucratic center. So when we move to central management, we get something that is easy to employ and use if you don't have a lot of shared context or local information like the acre. Okay, so this makes sense. This kind of makes sense that there's this pressure as we move to more modern informational systems that will push us away from using units like the hide, which require judgment and sensitivity to deploy towards things like the acre, which are there, which any, you can hire anyone, give them minimal training, they can measure off an acre anywhere. Right, that's that's the notion of portability. We already talked about GPA. Uh, one way to put it is in this crucial book, James Scott. Uh, this is kind of like maybe the most important book from the last thirty years. Um, uh, Scott says that states want the world legible in terms that are processable from a bureaucratic center. So states, and by states he means corporations and globalized capitalism and governments, any large scale information aggregation policy making body, can only see the parts of the world that have been rendered into formats that are processable through vast administration. The creepy part that I'm not going to talk about here, but I talk about elsewhere, uh, Scott also thinks that insofar as states want to be agents, that means they want to transform the world into a form that's more legible to them. And this involves things like gridding cities and giving everyone a social security number and creating even property laws, but that, that's for another day. So the high-level administration, says Scott, needs information from different areas standardized and quantified so they can aggregate it and bring the organization into view. It's important here to distinguish between quantification and standardization. Um, you could have quantification without standardization, right? Every teacher could make up their own rubric on a different scale. This would be useless in an institution, right? Well, you also need something like standardization of units, which regularizes the input rules and processing rules, and most importantly, regularizes the category. To make the GPA work, we all basically have to use the A through F scale. So the best study of categorization I know is Bowker and Starr, this incredible book called Sorting Things Out. Um, and what they say is that every form of standard, let me see if I have a slide for this. Um, so every form of standardization uh, requires categories for data aggregation, right? If you don't have standardized steady categories, you can't aggregate data. Point. They made this. Uh, star they made this point before modern machine learning methods i do not know if machine learning can get around this i this is an open question for people to know that ml but up until now as far as i know uh categories are required for data aggregation every set of categories they say each information collection happens in buckets and we decide what the buckets are and every bucket leaves out certain information and emphasizes other information. So think about the US census race categories, right? That categorization system emphasizes the difference between Latino and Asian and forgets the difference between East Asian and South Asian, right? So one of the things they say is, A, you have to do this for any kind of large scale data aggregation, right? You can't do it without it, but it always involves a choice about what to remember and what to forget, and which information is remembered or forgotten is chosen to serve an interest, right? So um, what they say, and I find this so interesting. Um, I taught this stuff in a social epistemology class, though, and my, by the way, and, my, and people went nuts for it, um, is that once these categories get built into information infrastructure, they get naturalized. And what they mean by naturalized is we forget that their contingency is created for a particular interest and think that's the way the world is. This is going to be an important theme, that once things enter information infrastructure, that becomes kind of the background of the way we think on, at scale. And then it's easy to forget that those categories were created at some point. So here's a particular worry for machine learning. So Bauer and Starr say that 
This is because information infrastructure becomes the unthinking background against which we conduct further investigations. And a particular worry I have, and we'll return to this in a little bit, is the opacity of machine learning might augment this effect by hiding the very categories that we have inside an opaque process that people don't, people use the outputs of without, without seeing. Um, for more on this, I have a paper about trust in technology that is called Trust and Unquestioning Attitude about background stuff. Okay, so that's that's the first part. Does, does, that, does that make sense so far? So the general worry is that there's a filter, that there's a number of filters to get large-scale aggregation. One is a bias away against intimate high-context information, and the other is that whatever categories you set up will forget certain information and remember other information, and that's built into the scale of large-scale aggregation. Um, okay. Second worry. So I'm worried that there are certain ways in which large-scale data collection efforts eliminate expert knowledge, especially what we call expert sensitivity. So uh, this is. So let me give you a warm-up. So I, I just want to briefly summarize a paper I wrote a little while back um, that got me into this topic. Uh, it's not going to be about ML and data. It's going to be about metrics, and then I'm going to try to generalize from that to the concerns that you all have. So. Onara O'Neill uh, has this amazing moment that most people have ignored. Uh, I found it very shocking. So in her Rife Lectures on Trust, she wrote, transparency can encourage people to be less honest, so increasing deception and reducing reasons for trust. Those who know that everything they say are right is to be made public may massage the truth. Public reports may underplay sensitive information. Head teachers and employers may write blandly uninformative reports and references. Evasive and uninformative statements may substitute for truth telling. There's more, but I'm going to move on. So to, to simplify one part of the argument, I think what she's saying is that th people think that trust and transparency go together, but they're deeply at odds because transparency, as we find it in public accountability systems, demands that experts justify their reasoning to non-experts. But by definition, expert reasons are often incomprehensible to non-experts. So Neil's argument is this forces experts into deception. I think there's an even worse worry you might have insofar as transparency guide, actually guides people's actions. Transparency systems ask experts to change their actions to the kinds of things that they can give public justifications for. But a lot of expert actions, by definition, don't, aren't comprehensible to non-experts. Uh, there's, there's all these case studies. So there's a particularly great one from Sally Engel Mary in the Seductions of Quantification. So Sengel, uh, Sally Engel Mary is an anthropologist. She worked in the UN um, on the Global Development Index, the, the ranking of human rights. And then the Seductions of Quantification, which is a delicious book, by the way, is she takes her anthropologist eye and she turns it on the UN committees that she was in that generated the GDI rankings, uh, the human rights rankings. She actually, uh, at one point, defines an indicator as a simple ranking or metric that hides the complexity, the social complexity and subjectivity of its manufacture. This is a great book. But she has this, these two chapters that are a case study of the, sex, of the State Department's sex trafficking index, which rates countries and how well they're doing at sex traf uh, reducing sex trafficking. So the index look solely at convictions of sex traffickers. This is a terrible approach. So the reason it's a terrible approach is, okay, you can reduce sex, she says, you can reduce sex trafficking. Sex trafficking is typically driven by poverty. If you reduce ambient poverty, you reduce sex trafficking, but without convictions. You actually get fewer convictions because sex trafficking just evaporates. So if you increase general wealth, and sex trafficking actually goes down, the index says you're doing worse because you're getting fewer convictions. But notice that actual sex trafficking is the kind of thing that's very hard to measure. Convictions are really easy to measure. It's the, they're the kind of thing that, are, that easily enter into official record keeping. Um, so this is an apparently good metric for performance if you don't think about it. And it seems to make sense to a lot of non-experts. But in the eyes of the experts, it turns out to be completely blunt and inaccurate. So transparent. There, there are a billion of these. Uh, I can, if you want Q and A, I can give you probably thirty examples of metrics that seem good and then turn out to be terrible. Um, 
So transparency forces experts to be ruled by metrics that are comprehensible to non-experts, and it can force them to reason with them. And insofar as those metrics function as the target or goal, then you're forcing experts to hit a target or goal that is comprehensible by non-experts. But insofar as it takes expertise to understand what you should be trying to do, be doing, for example, not just reducing, sorry, not just increasing convictions of sex traffickers, right? Then this is a problematic thing. So the, here's a quick version. The master argument of this paper, sorry, this is a paper of mine called Transfer. So I'm, I'm, the cold is in my brain. This is a paper of mine, Transparency Surveillance. The main argument is this. It's out already. You can read it if you want. Expertise often requires acting for reasons that aren't available to non-experts because some are reasons that require training or specialized information and others are tacit knowledge, what we know is skilled perception or informed synthetic experiences. Public transparency and expert processes demands that experts take actions for which they can give public justification, which limits them to actions that can be justified in non-expert terms. It undermines their expertise. By the way, I... I see Ricky smiling intensely. This argument, I take this argument to be trivially true and simple. And yet in various settings when I've given it, people ha have been just horrified. I mean, it's, it seems straightforward to me. I, I had an English dean write to me and she said uh, that she loved Schopenhauer, nothing in existential disturbed her. And this argument gave her deeper existential despair than anything else. I mean, she is a dean, right? So um, she lived by metrics. Um, and the example is not that there's some argument isn't that there are some examples of bad metrics. Hopefully it's clear that this is the essential logic of transparency, right? Giving justifications available to all that's in tension with expertise. So, right, this is the weird thing. We believe there's expertise and we, and somehow we also believe that experts should be fully transparent. By the way, I just want to say the argument here, sorry, I'm, I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff, but I'm not saying get rid of transparency. I'm saying that transparency is very high cost. Uh, and that you should, you should apply it. It does get rid of corruption and bias, but it also does this other thing at the same time as an essential part of its functioning. By the way, and I think this might interest people in this group, I think there's another argument, uh, another version of the argument, the argument from intimate reasons. So longstanding communities develop shared reasons that aren't available to those outside the community, call those intimate reasons. Properly assessing intimate reasons often requires long familiarity with a particular context or a long history, uh, shared history of communal deliberation and both expert, uh, but, and transparency undermines the ability to use these shared developed reasons. Hopefully some of the pieces from this, I admit kind of wild talk are trying to connect together. So transparency undermines intimate reasoning of communities. So here are some examples of intimate reasons. A philosopher's sense of interesting questions, an aesthetic, uh, an aesthetic sense of good flow and rap, a sense of cool and skateboard tricks, a game designer's discussion of friction in games, or, and I think these are really important for a lot of us, an oppressed co community sense of what terms are demeaning, an oppressed community sense of which acts of cult cultural appropriation are and aren't permissible. Um, I I'm going to skip some of this stuff. Here's what's, one of the things that's really interesting to me. M maybe I should go back here to the slide. I find as a lefty progressive that going before I wrote this argument for myself, I believed two things. I believed one in standpoint epistemology that marginalized communities have special understanding to things that weren't available to everybody else. And two, I believe that transparency was important and, and groups should be able to explain themselves to everyone outside. What actually got me on the road to this argument was watching uh, at my last university, an LGBTQ support group, under the demand for transparency, have to line item justify its budget transparently, see, to the Utah State Legislature, which does not understand the importance of safe spaces, right? So I think the weird thing for a lot of us on the progressive left is that I think there's a tension between the commitment to standpoint and epistemology and the commitment to public transparency. And I find that really difficult to stomach, but, right? I mean, one thing to say is that people always imagine transparency with some like corrupt public figure and some like good and well-meaning public. But for every one of those, there's an LGBTQ support group in the university that has to be transparent to the fucking Utah state legislature, All right? Sorry, I watched this play out. Um, so I'm gonna skip a little bit. So in some sense, I already kind of said this. I mean, really, let me, let me just say, and I, I, about this paper and about what I'm talking about in general, what I think I'm really worried about is the standard of public reason. And that 
data collection practices institutionalize the demand for public reason and the demand for general comprehensibility and usability. But various commitments you have might have, say, to either expertise or sensitivity or to standpoint epistemology are in tension with the demand for public reason because they're all commitments to say that some groups have special understandings that aren't accessible in principle to everyone. Ricky, you have a great expression on your face. I, I think you're having the reaction to this. This is, again, kind of nauseating to me. Um, so, so one way to put it, this is finishing up the transparency material, is I think there is a realm, the realm of the intuitive, the synthetic, where bias hides and corruption flourishes, and the realm of the intuitive and the synthetic is also where expertise and sensitivity and intimacy lives, and transparency kills all of it at once, right? It's very rough medicine, and I think it's important, but costly. So the current tendency is to treat transparency as wholly good and the more the better, but what we should actually think is that transparency is a really intrusive form of bureaucratic sur surveillance that limits corruption and limits expertise at the same time. And that what we should be doing is balancing trust and transparency as a painful compromise, right? People often ask me, what's the solution? The answer is, I don't think there's a solution. The solution is the essential tension between two things we want, transparency and expertise. When we trust experts, we leverage the ability of people to understand things outside of ourselves, but we also enable them to run and be corrupt and biased. When we demand that their actions are explainable to us, then we limit corruption and bias, but we also limit their ability to exercise their expertise and sensitivity outside our understanding. So the answer is every single decision about transparency is a painful one about a compromise between these two countervailing interests. So if, if you want more, this is in Transparency and Surveillance. This is the paper I've written I'm proudest of. I hate all my papers except this one. They're, this is the only one that is OK. OK, let me generalize from this to hopefully you can start to see where I'm going about data stuff. I'm going to try to generalize this, something about scale in general. So I'm going to worry that this, this specific worry I had about transparency metrics also shows up to any kind of scaled up data collection process so it's to, to varying degrees. It's not total, right, to varying degrees, because there's this expertise sensitivity bottleneck at the collection point for data. You need data to be collected in a reliable way, right? And the bigger the scale, the less you can depend on a particular group. So, and this, so this is inspired by this observation in the SCS literature on, uh, on quantification culture, again. So one of the things you see in a few places of literature is the same kind of thought. So there's some kind of information about political and religious beliefs that you can reliably elicit from trained sociologists and anthropologists who are embedded in a culture and know how to do a sequence of trained intimate questions. But that can't scale up. If you need a large amount of data, say, about political beliefs across America, you need to be able to farm out the question process to either college undergraduates paid low wages for phone surveys or just something someone can clicky clicky right on Amazon Turk or an internet quiz. So you need questions, modes of questioning that are usable without expertise or high contextual awareness. So let's. Ricky, this is very useful to me. You're very expressive and I can see you kind of like turning sad. I am also, this also makes me sad. I, I taught this stuff in my social epistemology class and the students were just like, fuck. Okay, so, so I think I've been stuck on this point for a while. And the thing that's helped me the most is this recent book from Lorraine Dastin on rules. So I'm gonna try to explain what's in that book and then give you a connection. So, um, so, Think so. The reason I'm talking about rules is you can think of a so every data set involves some kind of data collection procedure, and you can think of that as a rule bound process, right? That tells you to get the collect data on the height, compare something against a ruler, and look at the line, or count the number of milliseconds between heartbeats, where what counts as a heartbeat is this, or judge a student's work against a rubric, right? Every data collection procedure involves a rule about how you apply some kind of standard or how you sort things into categories. So Lorraine Dastin wrote a book about two years ago. She's, she had this incredible older book on the nature of objectivity and changing conception of objectivity. And this new book, Rules, is literally the coolest fucking thing I've read in like five years. It blew my mind. You should all read it. It's awesome. So she says that historically, there are three different conceptions of a rule. And they're very different. And we've lost touch with most of them. The first is a rule as a principle. So a rule as a principle is a generalization that admits of exceptions where the grasp of the appropriate exceptions is not something mechanical, but noticing it as a matter of 
sensitivity, right? You give the rule and then you know that sometimes it doesn't apply. A rule as a model is taking someone as an ideal. So she says, for example, the rule of St. Benedict, the rule is St. Benedict, right? The saint is the rule. You have the model. Notice that both principle and model, uh, those kinds of rules have a lot of unclear cases where you have to use kind of judgment or complex thought process or interpretive process to see how they're understood. The third conception is rule as algorithm, which is a rule applied to be intended to be applied mechanically. So what she says is this last notion, rule as algorithm, is a relatively recent notion that's come to dominance in the last few centuries and it's almost unheard of before the last few centuries. I just saw Ricky's eyes go, whoa, yes, it's wild. Um, and here's the amazing thing. She says that we, th then you might naturally think that algorithmic rules arise with mis calculating machines and computers. No, no, it happens about 100 years earlier in an attempt to reduce the cost of labor. So she goes through a long history of when we used to have trained experts who did mathematical calculations that required judgment. And we trans went through a long process of creating things like logarithmic tables that could be applied mechanically so you could hire cheap labor to do them. And you could transfer ex work from highly trained experts to low-skilled labor. By the way, groups of low-skilled calculators were uh, low-skilled laborers do running these tables were called calculators. That's where the term calculator comes from. And individual low-skilled laborers running the tables were called mechanicals in the 1800s. Um, and one of the things she says is algorithmic rules are inflexible and unchanging, and they work really well when contexts are stable and situations unchanging, but they do really badly when contexts shift rapidly and in highly dynamic situations, right? So here's an example from Dassin. This is, this example I'm writing two papers about. It's amazing. So here's how an old school non-algorithmic recipe used to look like. This is what cookbooks look like. Knead the dough until it feels bubbly and alive, adding sufficient water and flour to keep it balanced. Bake it in a half oven until it ready, right? Here's an algorithmic recipe. Mix two cups flour, one packet yeast, one teaspoon sugar, one cup water until you stretch the dough to the point of transparency. Bake for 40 minutes at 350 degrees. Can you see the difference between the two, right? The first one requires a lot of, I mean, it takes a while to learn the first one, right? And I'll freely admit, I use the second kind all the time. It requires a lot of judgment, but also if you bake, you know that the first one's actually more accurate. There's a kind of like dough changes, right? Humidity changes. The algorithm recipe doesn't adapt to those changes. The weird bubbly and alive thing actually tracks the quality you want through the changes better, but it requires a lot of expertise to apply. The algorithmic recipe is inflexible and in, so the interesting thing to me, uh, sorry, this is from another paper I'm working on, is the non-algorithmic recipe for its imprecision actually hits the target more reliably if you have the expertise to use it, where the algorithmic recipe can be applied by anyone, but often doesn't hit the target as well because it doesn't respond to changing contexts. Um, so that's what I just said. Okay, so the key to algorithmic rules is the mechanical application criteria. Mechanical here means, and this is from Dastin, this, sorry, this is me interpreting Dastin, means that you can apply it without significant effort, without skill or interpretation or an exercise of complex judgment. So mechanical application criteria make assessment easy, and they make it regular in this very particular way across scale, right? But the interesting thing is, again, the non-algorithmic one can make things regular when you have a small cadre of experts that are trained in a similar way. But if you need to scale it up, you don't get the reg that regularity. That demands this kind of me mechanicity. And so this is particularly clear in evaluations, right? I mean, what I'm really talking about here is the difference between thinking about and with a fairly loose rubric, evaluating your student's philosophy paper and standardized testing, right? Standardized testing is an algorithmic mode of evaluation. Um, so I'm particularly interested here in data sets, by the way, that try to algorithmatize the data collection procedure for some complex value, like well-being and health or the cultivation of intellectual virtue. And because of the demand of large scale information collection, need a collection procedure that's algorithmic. And then you get things like BMI and heart rate and VO2 max instead of something else. By the way, I can, if you're interested in this, I can highly recommend Elizabeth Barnes' new book, Health Problems, it just came out, that gives an argument that you can never get a metric for uh, health or well-being because it is by nature too vague and dynamic. 
we have similar paths. She's using the philosophy of uh, the philosophy of language and metaphysics of vagueness. And I'm using this stuff, but we talk, we were in agreements, but it's, it's super good. So in a lot of cases, I think what we get is this trade off between a fuzzy value and an algorithmic value, like the value of education to graduation rate or wisdom to LSAT score or informativeness to page views or retweets or beauty to engagement hours, right? Um, so you might complain that the explicit version is more objective. And I agree, but for a particular sense of objectivity. And it's not the sense of objectivity that involves strict actually to the world. Um, Porter calls what I'm about to talk about mechanical objectivity or legal objectivity. And I think his discussion, he says like, there's a standard of legal objectivity. And legal objectivity is the standard that a process be repeatable with the same results when applied by different people from different contexts. So if different people can apply a rule to a case and different people would come up with the same result, then it has legal objectivity. You can already see the gap. This thing, I feel like I'm, I'm coming to this idea from different directions of this weird gap. So, for example, you might think that we're trying to, uh, that a person's gaining various rights, like the right to vote, the right to buy alcohol, should be tied to their intellectual and emotional maturity. But that's a standard that's really hard to apply under the standard of legal objectivity. So, what's repeatable to everyone is a simple mechanical criteria like 18 years old. Does that make sense? So that meets the standard of legal objectivity, even if it doesn't exactly track what we care about the most. So here's the upshot. The process of making values explicit in a particular way in order to aid large scale institutional efforts at scale, which involves being applicable by people from different contexts who don't all have the same sensitivity, involves reformulating the values. So the rules for the evaluation criteria are clear and obvious and applicable without consideration or effort. Um, so why do we move to algorithmic rules? So Dastin and Scott tell one story. It's de-skilling, right? This is what we said before. It permits the uh, employment of cheaper labor. Um, but I think that's one part of the story. But another part is that... So I think what... Dastin's right when she says that mechanical applicability is application without judgment. But judgment, I think, has two faces. One is skill with expertise, and the other is cognitive effort. And I think these can come apart. So you can have high effort procedures with no skill, like dividing differently sized rocks into equally weighted piles through trial and error. And you can have high skill judgment that's low effort, like a trained singer hearing when something is off key. And mechanical rules can certainly be used to de-skill workers, but I think mechanical rules are often used by expert workers. So consider two different procedures, grading procedures for a philosophy exam. One is something really loose. A is excellent, B is good. We have some models, right? That's that's rule by model. Now there's a rubric where we count the number of grammatical and content mistakes, and an A is zero to five mistakes, and a B is six to 10 mistakes. Counting the number of mistakes in a Kant essay requires expertise, but it also introduces a mechanical procedure for issuing a grade that removes judgment. Does that make sense? So, so why do we, are we interested in judgment elimination if we're not cheapening labor? So one, function is to speed up work and reduce effort. And another, sorry, I just forgot to put this in the slide, is that it standardizes, it, it standardizes the application criteria, right? It regularizes it. So the process of algorithmization concentrates judgment in one place and time and then standardizes it and quickens it, the application later. Um, so by the way, this is a bit of a tangent. This is, uh, this is another paper I've been thinking about. And I think one of the things that happens when you apply this with your values is you become less responsive and sensitive to changing dynamics because what algorithmic rules are really doing is getting you cognitive efficiency and standardizability by generalizing process. So you have to perceive and think less in particular mo moments. You're using abstraction to skip particular judgments. So algorithms in some sense our social technology for conserving attention and deliberation by concentrating it. And I think this is an account of what it is to act automatically. So here's the worry. Let's get back to the data set question. Large scale data sets have a lot of reasons like you can see to involve input procedures that are, have algorithmic criteria, right? So that excludes applications of expertise and sensitivity. And you can see this is kind of variable with the scale, right? If, if the evaluation criteria is all trained zoologists, right, you can have a little more, but it still has to cross context. But when you really scale up the data uh, to something like GPA, right, you, you, you lose a lot of sensitivity in the data collection procedure. And it, and it prefers an objective means where objective is in this legal mechanical sense. And I hope it's clear that leaves out a lot of input procedures. Um, 
I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip forward a little bit. So here's the big picture to sum up. Machine learning efforts have to start with massive data sets that have been collected according to the limitations of large-scale data collection efforts. And the input procedures are, and again, let me just say, this is typically and usually designed to be applicable across contexts, like acres, or to remove contextually sensitive information, like GPA, and designed to be applied mechanically, like steps or BMI or Twitter likes. And hopefully it's clear that in each of these cases, we've filtered out particular modes of understanding the world. Last thing, really quick. I know I'm out of time. Um, so I want to apply all this stuff to a particular case, which is target. So in a lot of cases, in machine learning, in machine learning cases, the training of the model involves seeing which variation of the model better hits the target. And for that, you need a large target data set. Right. So his, his example, so Cena's example is that real world machine learning models predicting student success need a really big target data set of which students have succeeded. Um, and he was interested in the fact that that was defined by university administrators. I'm interested in the fact that all those large data sets have these constraints I've talked about on the collection of targets. And if there's any place where you might want context sensitivity, it is in setting your values and goals. So here's my own experience. About five years ago, I was in a conference. This is like a, a lifetime ago for AI. But in creative AI, using antagonistic training methods, um, and the target was to make good art. And I asked them. I was the one philosopher in the room. And I asked them, what's your operationalization of good art? And they said either high engagement hours from the Netflix database or high ratings for photos at the stock photo stock.com database. And I was like, that's not what good art is. And they said, what other data do we have? I mean, this is, this is all, this is, this is it. This is the whole point of the paper of what I'm, right? We don't have good robust data for good art. We do have good robust data for high engagement hours because that's a different kind of thing. And that's what you can train ML to hit. So here are two worries. One, who sets the target? Two, what large-scale data sets exist about success such that they can be used to train models? So here's the big worry. Many machine learning models are designed to either do something well or to predict which external world object will succeed. For that, they need to train a data on what counts as success that is quantified and clear. And the, there are constraints I hope you've seen on what counts as success. And every worry we've had applies. Um, so institutional metrics, what I've said, is they need to narrow information. They need to be standardized and stripped down to invariant qualities for portability and aggregability. Um, you need different people from different contexts to be able to understand them. That makes perfect sense, right? That is a good thing, but it introduces constraints. And I think those constraints are particularly visible in goal and target and value setting. So metrified values are subject to scale pressures of lower, uh, uh, of lowered context and denuancing. And I'm worried that machine learning procedures, insofar as where they start for training, the training data on success and targets, um, threatens to build those values into information infrastructure, right? Uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit again. I'm running out of time. So uh, last thing. One of the general thoughts from the STS literature on quantification is that procedures of quantification often conceal subjective or value-laden judgment and present their outputs as objective, right? And I, the apparent objectivity, they say, is stronger the more thoroughly the value-laden judgments are hidden. And my worry is that, I, so I've been worried so far about really the overt cases of this where you get like, you get into like Twitter likes. But I'm really worried with the ML processes that you can, get captured by a value without realizing it because the value ladenness of the judgment has been concealed inside a complex and opaque training procedure, right? So imagine having a system that tells you what students to admit, right? You might not even think that there's a value judgment there. You're just like, oh, right? But the machine was trained to predict which students would hit, have success and someone collected that success data and someone defined what counts as success. Um, and it's really, so in general, what I've, I've been worried about these cases where when you internalize a metric that you're outsourcing a value. And I'm particularly worried that you might be doing this without even realizing it because you're taking action based on uh, the outputs of an algorithm. 
um, that is opaque. Uh, and I think the last paper, I think I caught a little bit of it, I think it was about uh, HR hiring algorithms. And that's another, I think, like case where you should expect value ladenness to be hidden and opaque and then forgotten. That's it. Thank you. That was dope. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everyone has questions. Please start typing them up in the chat and we'll start calling on people that, I mean, yeah, this is awesome. Uh, remember to be kind, concise, constructive, and uh, don't be afraid to get weird and have fun. Wow. Uh, I don't want to go for like I have stuff, but I'm gonna I'm gonna wait a second. I'm gonna let some other people go before I go off. Actually, let me take a 30 second pause to get more water. Oh, absolutely. All right. Awesome. Yeah, Richard, you want to ask? Oh, yeah, I can read for you. Uh, would you share more examples of metrics that sound good but drive undesired behavior? Right. There are so many. Uh, one of my, okay. Uh, I'll give you the, okay, there are the place that I got first got wind of this. There was an excellent This American Life episode based on some ProPublica reporting about um, uh, case closure rates in policing. So the quantified policing, some of you may know this stuff, quantified, uh, quantified uh, policing became all the rage in New York. Um, and it was centered on something called case closure rate, which is the percent of reported cases that were reported closed. Um, this is high, a highly gameable metric. So there are a few ways to game it. One is you. what we quickly discovered that su is that police superintendents started making it harder to report crimes because that made your case closure rate better. Um, uh, they also tried to bury, they incentivized police to, uh, so a, a reason why there are a lot of traffic stops in some areas is that you open the case and close it at the same time. And so that also changes your stats. There's also something really similar in manipulations, the US News and World Report uh, admission stuff, where a lot of what they care about is acceptance rate. And so now universities and law schools are telling the recruiters to encourage people to apply who they know will be rejected in order to up their rejection rate, which moves them up the rankings. Um, but I think my favorite example of all is um, a Charity Navigator. So Charity Navigator, which I used to use uh, for a long time, their central ranking was the, their central ranking methodology was the throughput metric. So the throughput metric is how much money people donated made it through the other side. It sounds great. I use it. It's like, oh, you're low waste, right? What it actually forces uh, nonprofits to do is compete to cut internal costs which means they can't hire people, staff their offices, or hire adequate experts because that counts as an internal cost. So for example, uh, nonprofits that, uh, so nonprofits that are trying to improve water quality in areas with poor water, money they spend on water pumps in that area count as external costs and increase the throughput rating. Money hiring water scientists as employees counts as waste because it is internal costs. This is right. So I think that that's one of my favorites. One of there, there's a subtler one. Um, okay, this will reveal my own weird aesthetic ob objections, uh, obsessions. There are two that I started the inquiry with. One of them was the case closure rate, and the other was actually wine scoring. So one of the interesting things about the wine scoring procedure is in order to create an objective procedure, you don't have the wine with food. Right, so all modern wine scoring is done in an objective environment, which is not with food. So I the I've been trying to write about this. Uh, I I've been calling this uh, review drift, which is when the context of review drifts away from the context of use. So what it pushes you does it make sense? What it pushes you towards is a case where um, 
uh, is a case where uh, what, they, what they'll say is you get these really loud complex flavor bombs that actually tend to override food, right? And they get really high scores. Um, there, there's so much. Uh, the, sorry, I, I've all, in the review drift case, I, I think of all, so my, my favorite weirdo example is I've started noticing that there are a lot of well-reviewed clothes that feel really good and then fall apart after three months. And my theory is it's because people issue the review upon first wearing the clothing and no one comes back to it later. I think this is very, so I tried to describe something similar to this in my paper, uh, how Twitter gamifies communication, where I think p the Twitter interface encourages you to like something immediately. So if a thought trickles into your head and inspires a change two weeks later, that Will, is very unlikely to cap, get a like. So there are a lot of cases here where the, does it make sense? These are subtler cases, I think, where the constraint of the data capture gets this really thin slice. So here's another one. Um, uh, the US News and World Report law school rankings measures employment rate at the nine month mark, and they measure rate only. They don't measure quality. They don't measure lastingness. They only measure employment at the nine month mark. You can all, I mean, right? Hopefully the examples fill out the sense in which the, the ease of data collection and the, the ability to reliably capture it cuts out all this other shit that's very hard to capture. So there's even more, um, but is, is that useful or helpful? Tikla, you wanna ask yours? Thank you for this really dynamic and brilliant presentation. I really liked your distinction between high context intimate information and kind of big data algorithms. And it made me think of the distinction between qualitative and quantitative research. So I'm wondering to what extent your distinction could be mapping onto those categories or if maybe you would reject the framework of both of those standard categories. Um, I, it loosely maps, but there are, I mean, it loosely maps. And in general, this is Porter. The starting point is Porter saying that quantitative, infor, what quantitative, I mean, I think one way to put it is that the key concept is travel between contexts and quantitative information is typically very good at traveling, typically, and qualitative information is typically not. This is not always the same. So for example, one thing, you, you, in an institution, you can standardize a language of justification that isn't quantitative. What this looks like is learning outcomes and mission statements, right? Those are, I think, qualitative cases where the language is standardized in a way that has the decontexting problems. Then there are examples like Hyde, which is technically quantitative, but is very high context responsive. So it's not perfect, right? The map isn't exact. And I think the thinking about the relationship between travel and context gets more finely at this distinction. But in general, I think when people think about qualitative versus quantitative methodologies, What's, I think that people like Porter and Sabina Leonelli have explained that difference in terms of this travel quality uh, and that, that gets more exactly at the thing. But when I think we're talking about this is, in some sense, this is an explanation of that distinction. Great, thanks. That's really useful. And I love the example about the hide and the acre. Thank that, you. I mean, the hide is, I fucking like, I just, I don't know. That's my single favorite example of anything. I just find it so interesting. I was telling someone that like, you know, I was trained as an epistemologist and a philosopher. And it used to be that I cared about things like the meaning of life and what knowledge is. And now I care about things like the definition of land measurement <laughs> terms. Cause I actually think that's where the action is. If you want to understand how human knowledge works now. Charles, there you go. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so all along, I was sort of thinking back to seeing like a state through a lot of what you were talking about. So I'm wondering, are these all just problems that we're stuck with as long as we try to organize large scale institutions and states? Are we just like stuck? And like, those are the problems, unless we want to just get rid of states and go back to really small communities. Are we just stuck with all of this? Yeah, this is, this is the question. Um, okay, so I can say a few things. One, Scott, James Scott, seeing like I say, James Scott was an anarchist, though caveat, 
an anarchist who is a tenured professor at Yale. So whatever that says about your anarchism. Um, uh, I'm not an anarchist. I think there are goods of institutions and downsides of institutions. In particular, I think the place where the, the trade-off is most keen on both sides is the sciences. Large-scale data collection efforts that, I mean, science is a state in Scott's sense. It's a large-scale organized collection effort that requires some kind of standardization of information collection procedures. I mean, the, my claim here is like the method is very powerful, but also systematically leaves out a particular kind of understanding or approach to the world. So what do we do? Like, I, I mean, in some sense, I don't, so one way to put it is action at scale is very powerful, but I'm trying to describe the cost. This does not mean we shouldn't get involved in action at scale. This means we should have a keen eye towards its cost and sometimes not want to participate. Uh, so in the paper I wrote about values and metrics, which is, which is about to come out finally, it's called value capture. Um, uh, one of the things I ended up saying is, actually maybe what we should think is that some values are required for collective action, like, I don't know, action towards climate change that require very simple, clear metrics, like. CO2 emissions, and it's worth it in that case. And other kinds of values, like your aesthetic values, right? The values you take in your exercise, those don't require organization at scale. So maybe what we should be is value federalists. What we should think is for the same reason that we might wanna be federalists about policy, we should be federalists about values and action. And that there's some, that there are, there, we may wanna to try to refrain in some cases from the insistence on organizing and understanding things at large scales. And I think a lot of us feel this the most probably in our aesthetic lives, right? You don't want. So by the way, in, in, if you want another extended version of this, I think a great set of examples uh, come from attempts to define art and aesthetic value and measure them, which you certainly find. And so uh, Jennifer Lena's book entitled, she's a sociologist of music culture, and it's her history of the arts and the history of arts funding. And arts funding is driven typically by metrics for aesthetic value. And you can see the same problems of trying to develop uh, a clear, comprehensible, usable metric that cuts across aesthetic communities and you just start to think, no, there's no, you're not going to get an art value metric that's going to work across ballet and rap and comics and conceptual art, right? Um, so th the answer I have is, it's a version of the answer I have at the end of the transparency paper. This is just an inadequate attention. There are benefits and costs to scaling up collective information collection procedure. Sometimes you want to pay the cost. Sometimes you don't. Um, and if we go all the way to the standard where all of what counts as knowledge has to be passed through some kind of scaled up science such that the data collection procedure meets this decontexting port portability criterion, then we're going to lose a lot of shit that's important about human life. Is that satisfying at all? I find this vastly unsatisfying, by the way. I find this uh, nauseating. Sharon? Sure. I thank you for such a great talk. Um, and I've been following your work for a while. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great. So um, have you thought, I know you said this is like a, you know, a big problem and it's attention and uh, here we are. I mean, how do you get, do you have any ideas about resistance practices or virtues or something yes. like that that you can cultivate or, yeah. I don't know, uh, to help us sort of survive, maybe yeah. thrive? Yeah. 100%. Um, this answer is going to be really corny. I think that we have plenty and we know what they are and their names are things like playfulness, the aesthetic impulse, and irony. Um, so I've written a little about this. I have a paper about playfulness as an intellectual virtue. Uh, there's a bit of this at the end of the games book and I, I have a new paper coming out about this, but I think, so uh, I, I, I have a new paper out called Art as a Shelter from Science, which is directly about this. And, if, and it basically says something like, well, the aesthetic realm is a realm that insists on individual sensuous perception and particulars without the demand for, um, comprehensibility in terms of coherent inference principles that cross contexts. So I think we have, we have these, like uh, the, we have 
these tendencies, uh, they also are, I don't know, in some sense, I think a lot of this is just supposed to be a defense of still having the humanities in a university education, right? Like a, a lot of the stuff, um, a lot, a lot of the stuff that we, I think in your gut know that's important, like a sense of like distance and play and irony and like a, a sense of like something weird and easy about making everything explicable in bureaucratic procedures, right? All that, all those are the counter tendencies. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I love that. And I'm going to check out that paper because I haven't seen that one before. Yep. Uh, uh, Nancy, do you want to ask? Do you want to say anything, Nancy? Or we could read some of this too. I I see the question. I found this too. Yeah, very widely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just read it. Uh, Nguyen has presented a fairly solid assessment of the issues surrounding data collection and refining. Definitions and goals can vary widely based on what both the developer wishes to convey and what the user wishes to receive. Um, for example, what's the definition of success? That can vary substantially simply by someone's age and changes from day to day. I've been snow skiing for more than four decades. My original view of success would have been metrics that showed a specific speed, maneuverability, difficulty of the slope, length of skis, et cetera. Uh, now I have one metric to make it to the bottom of a run without falling. Um, yeah, so it's super. So I have this other paper that, that's about to come out called Value Capture, which is a lot about this. And Value Capture, the case of Value Capture for me are when you have some kind of rich developing individualistic or localized value, and then it, get cap it gets captured by a metric and you start caring about BMI or uh, your speed or something like that. Um, so one, one thing to say is uh, when you maneuver through something like a sport or a hobby or your profession, you do adopt different goals for success, right? But I think one of the things we do is we vary them. Um, and then we see, so I'm drawing really heavily here from this wonderful paper and book from Elijah Milgram. So the paper is called, it's an amazing paper. It's called On Being Bored Out of One's Mind. And the book that it is behind it is called Practical Induction. What he basically thinks is our goals and values um, should fit our character and personality in the place we're in. And we find out if they fit and serve us well empirically. So he says, basically, you try out a goal and a lot of involves being in a profession and saying, oh, I want to publish a lot or, oh, my goal is to, you know, go to a high status, right? And then you find out from your life with that goal, whether it's a good one for you to have. And the feedback he thinks is things like whether you're engaged and interested and alive or whether you're bored out of your fucking mind, right? This is, this is analysis of boredom. And then when you're bored, when you're disengaged, you adjust. So I think one of the things we often do is shift goals and slightly reconceive of goals to fit. I mean, so in, sorry, I'm, uh, I should explain something. In the background, so my account of games is that in games, you take on a goal, but the goal, the purpose of playing the game isn't to achieve the goal. It's the experience you have of trying to fit that goal. And then the goal is relatively better or worse, depending on whether the play experience is good or beautiful or fun. So that's really easy to see in games, right? The points aren't the point. The points are there for fun or whatever. I think the same is true of a lot of the goals we possess in life, right? Um, and the worry is that, uh, certain relationships to institutional metrics can remove that flexibility and tailorability. So the, so the argument of this value capture paper is basically that um, the problem with value capture is that it counts as outsourcing your values and outsourcing always involves a kind of like standardized in untailorability in exchange for ease of use. And that that's what you get when you just adopt say citation rates as your value. Um, and again, the worry in the ML case is that ML context can make that easier and more opaque. You can not even realize that you're being value captured because the thing that's guiding you is a target that was whose whose relationship to the algorithm is has been hidden inside the model validation process. Sorry, does that does that sort of hopefully that gets at the thing? 
I think we have a question from Paul and then maybe we'll go to Mitch. Hey, cool. Yeah, so this was this was a really cool talk. Um, there's lots of things that I've been trying to think through lately that you're touching on in really insightful ways and stuff. Um, there's, there's a question that uh, I asked yesterday of people um, and you started talking about it a lot and when you're talking about transparency and this, uh, and my mind immediately goes to Hannah Arendt's discussion of the sort of distance between science and uh, ordinary ways of thinking about things. Um, and a lot of what you were saying about transparency uh, essentially being like two different languages uh, that people who are say scientific experts or uh, working within these sort of data sciences um, and people who are outside of that sort of not not being able to communicate with each other in certain ways. And I was wondering, like I, I share this worry to a really strong extent and I'm wondering uh, if uh, Iris Marion Young's uh, concept of like differing modes of communication. She calls it like a communicative uh, politics, communicative ethics no. um, to try to differentiate herself from the sort of Habermasian framework. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you see some sort of promise in that and, and being able to sort of address this. A hundred percent. In fact, I have a paper where we hey. use Iris Marion Young to argue. <laughs> Sorry, I'm right. uh, yeah, this is absolutely absolutely the right connection. Um, so uh, I have a paper that I'm writing with Tim Sundell and philosophy of language that basically takes this argument and runs it again, runs it on the conceptual engineering project and says, basically, if you believe that language is under our control and you believe things like Iris Marion Young's conception of democracy, then you should think that semantics should be mostly under local control. The paper is called semantic self-determination. And right, exactly. So it's, it's kind of the same argument. So run without any reference to metrics and quantification and just about centralized and decentralized control of semantics. But yes, you're absolutely right. The, the connect, we're seeing the same connection. The part of this paper is Iris Marion Young's notion of democracy and justice and just making that work on language. And a lot of the things I said today about metrics, you can just re-say about institutionalized language. Uh, our examples, one of the key examples for us is um, uh, autism advocates trying to intervene on the definition of autism in the DSM-5, which uh, was put together without any autistic people's input. Um, right. And then there's another great case study. Paul Nadazdi has this incredible book called Hunters and Bureaucrats, where he looks at um, the interaction of Canadian bureaucracy with First Nations people in the in the Yukon. Depressingly, it's not like shitty colonial people, but well-meaning progressive bureaucrats trying to incorporate First Nations people in discussions. But what Nadasi ends up saying is, but they're required to speak in the Canadian language of property at all times. And First Nations people don't get to use their own conception of property in the talks and everything goes to shit. So, but yeah, you, you, yes, you, 100%. Good. I'm yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. That's really cool. Yeah. Mitch. Okay. Thank you. So, um, I I can see how um, non transparency could be useful. For example, for purposes of self protection. Yeah. Um, but in a lot of the cases that you've offered, which are bureaucratic settings, um, I sometimes wonder if the problem is transparency or bureaucratization. Um, so one example that came to mind is um, the, the university syllabus that I have to give my students, which is like 15 pages of university boilerplate, <laughs> boilerplate. Yeah. and it's supposed to be for like partly for purposes of transparency, but I think it's mainly meant to protect the university from litigation and complaints. Right. <laughs> um, so it's not necessarily bad for me to be transparent, but it's just that like bureaucratic institutions demand uh, certain kinds of reasons that essentially like protect them from criticism and, and litigation. So is, is the transparency the problem I wonder, or the, the, like the, the bureaucratic right. process? Right. So, I mean, it, in some sense, a lot of the examples are overdetermined. Uh, and I think a lot of the examples can be explained in terms of both transparency and bureaucratization, but they're separable. So, uh, a lot of the, so, I take it that what you mean by bureaucratization is something like uh, the 
the attempt to make everything, uh, the attempt, I mean, the attempt to provide legal cover such that you, you won't be sued, right? So there are some cases like that, but I think, so examples like uh, um, charity navigators throughput rating, that doesn't look like a bureaucratization example. That looks like a clear transparency example. What you're trying to do is hold institutions to account to doing things in ways that are well and doing it by making clear to the public how well they're functioning, but where the constraint is, um, whether the, where the constraint is the comprehensibility of the functionality measure to a wide scale public. So I think they come apart. Um, and uh, one, I think I'm particularly interested in the transparency wing because I find it more damning and worrisome. So bureaucratization, I can dismiss. I can be like, oh, whatever. That's just people that are like, you know, giving themselves cover. Like a good institution wouldn't operate like that. My worry is that just there are other pressures that simply arise from very good functions, collective organization and accountability that introduce that just by themselves introduce those problems too. So I think you can get there in multiple ways, but I'm worried that some of them are irreducibly connected to collective efforts to store, manage, collate, and act on data in a way that's uh, comprehensible and that, you'll, that you can see the problems arising in those cases too. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna jump in real quick. Then. All right, so I've been I've been uh, writing a lot about uh, the costs of optimizing and maximizing recently, right. and how I think like this leads. Oh my god, like you, everything else becomes instrumentally useful for whatever you're maximizing on, and and, right. and trying to maximize on multiple things, you force them to be commensurable, and so right. you, yeah. you know, same flattening worries. And, and like, uh, in the end, like I'm trying to, I guess what I'm asking for is help seeing the connection here between like how data flattens things and how maximizing flattens right. things. Right. And that, that, my opinion is maximizing on these sorts of same like portability. And yeah, that's an amazing question. Um, let, let, me, let me warm up. So when I first, the first draft of my game stuff, which was about the pleasure of games being that you had a clear experience of values in the game, um, but we should be worried about exporting that to the world. I showed this to Elijah Milgram, um, and his comment was, thank you, T, for giving me a good error theory of the appeal of utilitarianism and uh, various maximizing uh, economics approaches. They make sense as games. Um, anyway, yeah, so they're deeply related. Uh, how to distangle them. Um, I mean, I guess the way to relate them in gen in particular is that, I mean, I'm almost starting to think that the, that the worries about optimizing a metric are a special extreme case of the data collection worry, right? But the worry in general is this like, removal from what you see of anything that isn't measured. Um, by the way, if, you, if you're interested, so I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up a draft. If anyone wants to see it, I can send it to you. Uh, I have this paper I'm working on called Value Collapse that some of this stuff was drawn on. And the paper is basically about how explicit values discourage exploration by making you not see anything that isn't measured by the value. Um, and, uh, Yeah, I guess, so the, the, the worry about optimi optimizing has to do specifically when the, the thing that's measurable becomes a target. And I think that's the worst case uh, because insofar as it's guiding your activity, so the worry from the paper is something like, insofar as it's guiding your activities and you're not gonna explore stuff that falls outside the metric and then you're not gonna find out if it's any good or not, right? Um, so that's the worst case scenario. The data stuff, Cover also covers is also a worry that extends to non-targets and non-metrics and non-goals, 
right? So I think I think one way to put it is it the data stuff shows that you might collect uh, a limitation on data collection procedures, but when you but the worry with optimizing on a single metric is that it's particularly bad when you take those kinds of filters you get from the data collection process and build it into your central goal um, because it changes how you explore the world. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, yeah, this is helpful. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna keep working on this. So yeah, we're, we're worried about very similar like flattening things. And so this yeah. is all, I love this so much, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, one one thing I want to say, I, I've been watching some of the comments go. I haven't been able to read all of them, but one thing I want to say is that Mary had this comment about in-group and uh, out-group culture. And I should say that one of the starting points for the stuff I'm doing right now is, is a paper I wrote with Matt Stroll called A Cultural Appropriation of the Intimacy of Groups. And we found the notion of intimate understanding crucial in any justification of cultural appropriation. It's actually where I started, where I started thinking about intimacy was trying to understand cultural appropriation and how cultural appropriation claims were misunderstood by people outside the key culture. So, I mean, that, that connection is also like a really important one for me. And it, it I mean, it shows up in the transparency stuff about uh, the tension between transparency and standpoint epistemology, right? Everyone looks tired. Maybe you all should have social hour. Yeah, maybe it is time. <laughs> Shall we? Yeah, Jeremy, thank you. See you in. This was amazing. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.